Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for this webinar. Uh, the topic of this webinar is on uh, determining rock and soil material properties. Uh, the product that we will be looking at here is uh, RS Data, which is the newest tool that we launched from Rock Science uh, end of uh, last year. Uh, I'm Ali Reza. I'm a, one of the geomechanical specialists at Rock Science, and I was part of the team who developed this uh, new tool. So at Rock Science, we develop 2D and 3D softwares for civil mining and geotechnical engineering uh, problems. Uh, if you categorize these softwares to three groups, we have uh, tools for slope stability, excavation design, and geotechnical tools that we classify these, all these products that we have in Rock Science in uh, these categories. Uh, one of the very famous tools that we have is our slide two program, which is used in uh, 2D, which is, which is used for 2D limit equilibrium slope stability analysis based on uh, uh, method of the slices, limit equilibrium. And this one you can do a slope stability analysis. We can do a special variability analysis, lots of statistical analysis. You can use it for support design. And uh, you have so many tools available in it. But one of the key uh, components of each model that we make in slide is our material models and how we represent their shear strength in the simulations. For example, all these strength criteria, these are available in slide to describe the shear strength of the material. Each one of them, it has its own equation. And for example, you are looking at general hook parameter criterion here with this equation between uh, major and minor principal stresses. And we use these numbers here, these parameters, and the numbers that we assign to them to describe that shear strength criteria and represent that material in our uh, limit equilibrium analysis. S-fetch, for example, this is our surface fetch analysis tool for a slope. And again, uh, there are lots of capabilities in this software. Again, one of the components that we have here is the strength that we consider for the joints. Uh, we are looking at part and bandits criteria here. Again, uh, Another simple criteria for shear strength against more Coulomb. And we are using these numbers and these equations to represent these entities, these uh, geometrial joints and uh, in discontinuities in our model. RS2, our 2D geotechnical finite element analysis software. Uh, it can be used for solving boundary value problem, including in RS2 again, one of the components that we have and we have to define in our model these are geomaterials that are included in the simulations. Uh, we have different families and, and classes of constitutive models, and all of these are defined with the strengths, sort of, and stiffness parameters. And all these numbers, for example, you can look at them for the north end material model that we have here. Uh, these are defined here to represent that material behavior in our simulation that we are conducting in RS2 using the finite element model. So all these numbers that are we are putting in here, these can be important in representing those materials and they will affect our, uh, the final result that we are getting from our simulation. Now, let me uh, give you this quote from Everett Hook, Professor Hook, uh, regarding input data and their estimation. He says that assigning numbers to geology requires a delicate balance between the commonly held opinion that geology cannot be quantified and the overly optimistic view that every physical quantity can be described in precise mathematical terms. So to address this, we are introducing RS data. RS data is our versatile toolkit for the analysis of rock and soil strength data and the determination of strength envelopes and their physical parameters. Uh, the main focus and functionalities that we have in RS data and we're trying to address these uh, problems is to analyze and investigate material strengths and behavior, compare the strength criteria and constitutive behavior with the actual data that we have from laboratory or field, choose the appropriate strength criteria that, and the constitutive model that can represent our materials uh, to the best of our ability, and then calibrate the strengths of these materials and determine the constitutive model properties or parameters. Doing this, we will have uh, 
a good set of uh, constitutive model strength criteria to describe the material behavior and using these uh, in our other simulation other more complex simulation we can get better results from our numerical models uh, again uh, this is proposed by Everett Hook again Professor Hook this is the workflow that he's suggesting uh, the rock mechanics uh, people who are practicing in this field they use this flowchart to their to do their simulations and numerical modeling is suggesting that you start with geological observation or some quantitative input based on uh, established rock mass indices and uh, you have your descriptive inputs from these you can get your gsi gsi characterization of the rock mass having that along with some laboratory testing on rock mass samples intact rock samples you can get the general hook-parent criteria that represent the properties of the rock mass. Having that, you have you can have the parameters for uh, the rock mass, defining the rock mass in your numerical analysis. Then you will make your model, including uh, uh, entering in situ stresses, groundwater condition, damage factor, and uh, geometry, excavation sequence, and all that. You make your model, then you run your numerical analysis. After that, uh, you compare your results and verify it with the site monitoring data or back analysis. And you go through this loop to calibrate your numerical model so that it's gonna be, uh, it's gonna represent the physical phenomenon that you're simulating uh, more accurately. And you are calibrating your numerical analysis to the actual data that you are getting. Uh, the RS data comes and help us in this bunch of the activities that we are doing at the top here. So we get those parameters required for numerical analysis, then we do the numerical analysis. Now, uh, just to emphasize how important it would be to have these parameters correctly defined in a simulation, I'm showing you two simple examples here. Uh, this is a simple slope stability problem that I solved within a slide. Uh, the slope height to length ratio is 2.2 over three. And uh, the general friction angle that I assume for this material is uh, 45 degrees. So generally we are expecting to have this factor of safety tangent of 45 divided by two over three. The average factor of safety for this slope with the friction angle of 45 is 1.5. Now assume you have plus minus one degree error in estimation of the friction angle. Uh, assuming that everything else is the same, just looking at this plus minus one degree for the friction angle. If I have my friction angle defined 46 degrees, I'm getting factor of safety 1.55. If I have it defined as 44 degrees, the factor of safety that I'm getting here is 1.45. The difference between these two is like 10% in the factor of safety, but in most standard codes, the required factor of safety to design the slope is 1.5. So this one is acceptable, this one is not. And to achieve the acceptable factor of safety, this one degree plus minus, the error that we have here, translate to this factor of safety here. And this can be translate, translated to a big amount of money when you are designing your mine. This was just plus minus one degrees. Another example. Let's look at a simple bearing capacity problem. I solved this one in RS2. We are looking at the cohesionless material. The only parameter that I'm playing with here is that friction angle. Again, we are looking at friction angle 45 degrees plus minus one degree. This is the load versus displacement graph that I got from this simulation. If I have friction angle 44 degrees, the maximum axial load that I can get from this problem is 5,000 kilonewton. If I have 46 degrees for friction angle, I'm getting close to 8,000. This is close to 50% difference in the bearing capacity. Again, plus minus one degree, I got 50% different in the bearing capacity that I'm getting in this problem. Now, this is dependent on the problem that we are solving, depending on so many things, but the only thing that I varied between these two examples that we looked at is only plus minus one degrees in that estimation of friction angle. So these numbers that we put in the simulations, these are actually very important. Uh, just uh, 
where we get these numbers usually you can get these uh, for example for sharing and cohesion you can get them from the field institute tests uh, like cpt spt or you can run some laboratory tests such as direct shear simple shear triaxial tests and uh, all these kind of different tests that we have in soil mechanic laboratory to get these values uh, now let me start with our data and show you how we can use our data to help us get these parameters and we use them in other simulations. The first example that I will show you here is uh, uh, comparing a rock mass versus intact rock strength criteria. So I'm gonna start rock data. Uh, when you start the program, uh, it will suggest these three templates for you. Uh, Let's assume the first, uh, I'm, as a practitioner, I am dealing with a site, with a project that I have sandstone there, and I don't have any other information about the material properties that I have. What I would like to do here, I would like to give, get some ideas of what are my parameters, what could I use for strength of the material that uh, I can define in my other simulation to get some preliminary uh, analysis going. So coming here, I'm dealing with sandstone, it's a rock. So I will go with the rock template here. I'm double clicking this one. Uh, the program starts in rock mode. Uh, I have in the visibility tree, I have a material node, which has a material model, which is a rock here. And I have some failure sets. I will use this later. So I'm just gonna delete this one here for now. I have a material node and a material model. The material model by default is my general so brown one. And I have some, uh, typical values defined here. And these panels in the middle, I'm looking at the strength criteria in principal stress space and shear normal space. And at the right side, I have the table that I have all the material properties to define the strength of this material. Now, I mentioned we have, we are dealing with sandstone. We have these pick from the list option here. If I click on this, the typical values for these parameters, you can pick them from these charts that are presented here. So I was talking sandstone, so that uniaxial compression strength of sandstone is usually between 100 to 250, or here we have it between 50 to 100. Uh, I'm gonna go for some average value, 175. That's gonna be my uh, uniaxial compression test, strength for this material. Uh, let's just look at the intact rock for now. So, so GSI is going to be 100. And MI is another properties of that intact rock. Uh, I'm dealing with sandstone. It's sort of sedimentary rock. I will filter the list for sedimentary rock. I have the sandstone at the bottom of the list here. Average value for MI is 17. I will select that one. Press enter. Now, I have the strength envelope that can describe a typical sandstone intact rock. Now, uh, I can directly input my GSI classification and damage factor here and downgrade the strength of intact rock to my rock mass, but just to have it as a separate rock mass versus rock mass versus intact rock comparison, I'm just gonna add another material node and the second one is going to be my rock mass. I will keep the intact rock here so that we can compare it. So to have one of these material nodes here, and define all those material models and all that on top of that, you can add a material. So this one is going to be my rock mass. And the first one, I'm actually gonna rename it intact rock. And to define material properties, we have the option here, define them. I'm gonna go in there. So this is my initial rock that I have. Uh, I'm gonna name this one intact rock and I'm gonna add another one. The second one is going to be my rock mass. I'm gonna name it RM. And I will copy all the properties of that intact rock. I will copy it to my rock mass. Okay, so both of them are the same now. Okay, and I will assign the rock mass to this, uh, that rock mass material model to this rock mass node here. I can right click here, apply material model here. I will select that RM 
uh, abbreviation for right mass. Now, both criteria are shown here, but uh, since I just copied it and I haven't applied the GSI factor on this, they are on the same uh, line. Now, for the right mass, I can assign my GSI and the damage factor. Let's say, according to my observation in the field, the surface condition and the structure of the rock mass that I have in the field, uh, I can pick my GSI value from the chart. You can click anywhere that is best representing the surface condition and a structure. Let's say I have, I'm clicking here, 50. If I press OK, my GSI is 50, and you can see the down gradation of strengths from rock, intact rock to rock mass here. The other option that I have here is the damage factor. I can again go to pick from the list. I have based on application and the slope and the condition that we are doing blasting and excavation. You can select the value that is best describing the field operation that you have. Let's say, for example, uh, I'm going for good blasting and slope. My dispersion factor is 0.7. Apply OK. And if you notice, this uh, rock mass strength dropped down a little bit further. So now you can see uh, a comparison between uh, intact rock and rock mass strengths here. What we will be using in our simulations later on is going to be the properties of the rock mass. These are the properties of the rock mass. So this is the GSI classification for it. GSI 50, this is on factor 0.7, and MBS and A are the parameters that we use to describe the uh, strength envelope for this material in RS2 and slide, for example. If you click on any of these, the data that you are getting is correspondent to the material model that is uh, on that node. So this one is the intact rock, properties are given here. This one is the rock mass. Uh, some of the functionalities of the tool, if you double click on any of these panels, you will just see that panel that's gonna be maximized for you. Uh, if you would like to see that more Coulomb fit that we have defined, we have calculated for these materials, these criteria based on the failure range that we have for them. We are using that general failure range here for them. Uh, you can overlay that more Coulomb. And if you would like to have uh, instantaneous more Coulomb, sample are calculated for you, you can select this one. At any point that you select, it is, gonna, it is going to give you that cohesion and friction angle corresponding to that point. All these functionalities are available to you. Now, uh, this was the case that I did not have any information. I just knew that uh, I'm dealing with sandstone and I had some field observation and I used my GSI classification and I applied it to this one and I got some input and I can take it to my slide or RS2 or other simulation that I'm doing. Uh, the next case that we are dealing with here uh, is a case that, okay, I'm dealing with sandstone in my site, but uh, I have some information about the two types of sandstone that I have in that field, and uh, we have done some uh, triaxial tests on them, different confinement, and I got the failure points for them. Now, I can actually calibrate and get my uh, strength envelope calibrated and fitted to this actual data that I have. To do this one, the way to go around it, I will start again our data. Okay, again, I'm dealing with rock. I'll go for the rock template. This one, uh, this is going to be my sandstone. And this is the first uh, sandstone that I had, is the uh, uh, quartz. Sandstone. For this one, what we had, these data that we got them from the experiment, the reaxial test simulation, I can copy these failure points. And the failure point that I already have in my rock template in state one, I can paste all those numbers here. Now, all these red tests that you see, these are the actual data that we got from uh, the reaxial test in the lab for this. Uh, Sandstone Schwartz material, and I can calibrate this failure criteria that I have to these ones. To do the calibration, uh, there are two ways to go around it. 
easiest way if you have everything defined for a material you can right click on any of these nodes and apply the calibration node so my calibration node is uh, activated on this material now i will use a strength type general smooth, uh, general hook brown for this one i'm using the states that i the failures that the state that i actually just copy pasted here to define this for my calibration these are all lab data then you can use you can choose your curve fitting analysis method i would use modified cuckoo with error summation of basic and error type absolute so now the curve the failure envelope has been fitted to these data points that i have and the results are given here so those default value that i have for usc for example was 100 now it's 57 point uh, 019 this is the actual value that we have for this uh, sandstone schwartz the second type of sandstone that we had this uh, Jamison and Tofo. I can bring that one in as well. To do that, I can add another rock template here. The second one is going to be my sandstone. Let me name it uh, Jamison. And the failure state for this one, I can copy paste again from the Excel chart that I have here. Copy this one paste it here the blue ones are representing the failure states that i got for that jamison uh, sandstone again i can right click here apply my calibration node select my calibration method and when i do the selection the green graph which is uh, fitted to that uh, failure state state number two is representing my new uh, failure criteria for that sandstone Jamison. Now, let's say uh, I would like to know what is the average criteria that I can fit to all these failure sets that are defined here. So failure set one and two, or maybe I have more failure sets that I have defined in the uh, project here. The material properties we are defining we are defining them through this dialog define here and apply with this one the failure sets are defined here if i go click it here these are the two failure sets that are defined here you can have as many of these listed here for you if you would like to use any of these any combination of these failure sets in your calibration you can go through the calibration wizard i'm starting that uh, it is going to get one of these material models that you have in the domain as the input to start the calibration uh, you will Create a new material through this calibration. You can name it whatever you want. So this is going to be, I'm going to name the material model at least sandstone all. And I'm using general hook front criterion for the care fitting algorithm. I would use that modified cuckoo, basic, and uh, absolute for care fitting analysis. And I can select as many of these failure states that, that I have there for my calibration and press OK. This new material, let me just change the color to red here so that we can see it better, is a new calibrated model that is uh, calibrated to all these failures that, that I had in the domain, in this model. Uh, if I hide the previous two materials, you can see that this is actually a better fit to all the data points that we have. This was just a, a practice to uh, show you how many of these, uh, as many as these failure sets that I have in the domain, I can actually apply them in my calibration. Okay. Uh, after calibrating your intact rock, then you can apply the GSI factor, GSI classification to it, and uh, take those values as your as they represent the rock mass strength and take them to your simulations. Now let's go back to the presentation. Uh, so we did this one as well. Now the next step, this one is actually taking uh, the calibration process one step further. Um, looking at a car flow his hand, I have a different uh, triaxial test results, and I also have the stress passes for these. 
So in this one, I will not start from scratch. I will start from this prepared pipe and I will watch you through uh, what I have done here for this uh, car saw stand example. Okay, uh, let me turn off some of these entities that I have here. So for this car saw stand, uh, we have failure state sets. Uh, we have eight triaxial test results. And these are the failure points that we got from the triaxial test under different confinements. You have the variation of sigma three with sigma one. These are the failure points and these are the more circles. Uh, the material model that I have at the first node uh, for this material, I'm using more Coulomb and I have calibrated this more Coulomb. I have a calibration node here as well, which is set everything and I have the material properties of this more Coulomb model calibrated to this data set, failure set that I have defined for it. As you see, I'm getting friction angle 38 degrees and cohesion 31. Uh, the next step would be, okay, if I would like to have a constitutive model to represent this material in my finite element simulation, I can go to a stress path graph. If I go to this one, uh, among the nodes that I have on this material is my stress passes. In the stress passes, you can define them from here, define the stress passes. I have all those uh, laboratory stress passes that we had done the actual test on this samples of car soil stand uh, under different confinements listed here. So let's look at triaxial 400, for example, here. This is a triaxial test, a uh, drain triaxial test. The loading direction is axial. The test start from uh, confinement of 400 and initial consolidation is K not equal to one. And I have the variation of axial stress, axial, axial strain, axial stress, and the volumetric strain. This is going to define uh, this light blue line in uh, the graph that we have here. We are looking at axial stress versus axial strain, volumetric strain versus axial strain, Q versus the strain and uh, the, in the stress space, PQ is light blue line. The other test that I have here to, for demonstration is that triaxial that we have conducted under a confinement of 800. This is the dark blue line. Now, uh, using this constitutive model, friction and cohesion are calibrated. The stiffness I have calibrated to the first part of the graph and uh, first part of the behavior here. Uh, I have added two test simulations here. This one is test simulation triaxial test drain compression starting from 400. I'm just going to add like a couple of more number of steps for my loading. And this other one is 800 uh, triaxial test that is starting from confinement of 800 kPa so that we are representing the same two tests here. These are experimental, these are simulation. If I show them to you, activate these nodes so that we can see them, you can see that the results from these test simulation, because we calibrated the strengths, the maximum loads are the same. And in the PQ space, we are getting to the end of that failure state, we capture that properly. All the stress level, shear stress level are actually matching the data perfectly fine. But the behavior that we are seeing from start to failure is not matching the actual behavior. Uh, we can use another constitutive model uh, to best describe this hardening behavior that we are seeing here from the experiment. One of the material models, for example, that we have for this case is uh, our softening hardening model. Most of these material models that we have for soil application, they usually have some uh, parameters that some parameters or actually the direct uh, friction angular cohesion or other parameters that are that can be driven from these two so this one actually takes that friction angular cohesion directly as an input so what i use here for this one i'm using the same cohesion and friction angle that we calibrated for that more coulomb 30, 31 and 38 i have the same 31 and 38 for this one for this material and this one has some additional material properties here that i will address uh, following this activation of the graph. So if I show this one, you can see that 
the orange, this hard suffering hardening model is actually capturing the observed behavior in the lab much, much better than the uh, elastoperfect plastic morculum. Now, let me turn off the morculum. Let's deal with the hardening, uh, softening hardening one. This one, uh, for the first version of uh, first, first version of our data, we don't have the calibration for these two. You can easily manipulate them manually here and see the effect of them on the uh, results. But later versions of our data, we will be presenting you with the calibration tools for these parameters as well. So let's say I'm looking at, at that hardening property, hardening parameter here. If I had it, for example, instead of 002, I had it at 005, the behavior that we are looking at here is much softer than what uh, we saw before. If I had it a lower value, it is going to be more stiffer. This is the effect of that hardening property. The other parameter that I have here is that dilation angle, which in case of compaction dilation formulation, it is your uh, critical friction angle. If I have this one defined uh, for higher value, like 35, but you can see here, I'm guessing, I'm getting much, much, much less uh, dilation behavior that I was supposed to get comparing to experiment. If I have it lower value, let's go for 20 degrees, for example, I'm getting more of dilation. So you can manually play these with these parameters and the best of them, uh, the, the one that gives you the best match, you can use it as the representative parameters and take them to your simulation in RS2. Uh, one of the cool features that we have here, let me show you how this uh, softening hardening model actually works. Uh, let me show you the stress path for that, uh, the test, similar triaxial test under confinement of 800. The blue lines that you see here, these are the yield surfaces. And if I animate this stress path for you, you can see the hardening behavior that we are predicting with this material behavior. You can clearly see that isotropic hardening that we have for the uh, yield surface and the expansion of it until it is reaching to that maximum value of friction angle and it's gonna stop there. Uh, this is good to go then, and let's go back to the presentation. Using RS data, you can actually answer so many questions about your constitutive modeling. Like, for example, what is a dilation angle? What is a critical state? Let me just simply add this, these questions. I'm starting RS data, and I'm dealing with soil here because I'm looking at those uh, questions that are more related to soils. I'm going to go to my soil template. The soil template starts with a material that has a material model, which is more cool, and it has a test simulation, which is a triaxial under terrain triaxial test under confinement of 100. And we have a set of failure points. I don't need this one, but let it be here for now. What we are looking at here, let me add a couple of more points here. For our simulation. Uh, this one, the material is using dilation angle of zero. So at failure, what happens, uh, then the dilation angle is zero, the failure happens that plastic flow, continuous uh, unlimited plastic flow that you have at the failure is going to happen at constant volume. So if I animate this stress path, you can see that start from zero, uh, start from confinement, gets to failure, and at failure, you can see that the stress path doesn't show any volumetric change anymore. So it's going to be constant volume. To, com to just uh, compare it with the case that you have dilation, I'm just going to add another soil template. This one is also getting the same uh, default material. I'm just going to assign dilation angle 5 degrees for this one. You can see that immediately, what you saw here, the volumetric behavior between these two materials are different. The only difference between these two materials is that the dilation angle being zero in the first one and five in the second one. Now, if I animate the second one, you can clearly see that 
after failure, you have the dilation behavior happening for the second one. Then you start a new one, you address the critical state. Critical states, uh, <coughs> you have it for materials such as clay. Let me go to presentation again. Uh, and one of the material models that we have to represent clay best is our modified camp clay model. And uh, what happened at critical state is that after initial state, you're going towards shear. Uh, when you get to critical state, the plastic flow will happen at constant volume and the level of stress is going to be constant too. And uh, the representation, if you are looking at the yield surface is going to be the peak of that ellipse uh, or where the normal vector to the yield surface is actually vertical in the peak U space. To address that one, let me start with the soil template again. Instead of more coulomb, I will change it to modified camp clay to make it get to that uh, critical state faster. I'm just gonna make kappa smaller and also lambda four times of that one, typical value. And the first model, I will go for normally consolidated. So OCR is equal to one. And if I look at this three axial test results that we are looking at here uh, under confinement of 100 and animated for you, you can see that hardening behavior, expansion of the ellipse, and at the final point of critical state, when the stress state reaches to that peak point, you have the constant volume and constant shear. If I add another material here, this one again, I will make it modified camp clay. I will assign the same properties here, but this one, instead of going for uh, normally consolidated clay, I will go for highly over consolidated clay point, uh, OCR of five. And the behavior that you see here is uh, shooting up. And after that, you have uh, the softening behavior. But both of these two materials, since everything was the same, every, of, every other material properties were the same for them except the OCR, they have the same critical state, the same level of stress, and uh, they are approaching to that level. And in both cases, uh, you will end up with a, a constant volume at the end of failure. Let me show you the second stress path. The second one is starting from the same location, but your initial cap is actually uh, five times of the 100 here. So a start of the cap, the cap initial cap, uh, the pre-consolidation pressure is 500. So if I start the animation, it is, go, it is gonna go elastic. It is touching the yield surface, then it's shrinking the yield surface down. You have the softening behavior and you're approaching the critical state uh, from that higher level of stress. Okay, uh, let's go back to the presentation. Uh, one of the advanced material models that we have introduced in RS2 and RS3 is our North Sand material model. This one is uh, very good in evaluation of static liquefaction. And static liquefaction, let me show you this YouTube video of uh, the case that we had this static liquefaction for this tailing dam. We just go back a little bit. Just because of the condition that you have for this sandy material to, for this tailing dam, and uh, you had that pore water pressure build up in it, you had the liquefaction and the tailing dam fails. And uh, because of uh, this liquefaction and generation of that high level of excess pore water pressure in the domain. Uh, to simulate this kind of behavior, we have our North Sand material model. Let me show you an example for this one. Uh, this is one of the examples that we actually shipped with the product. In the example folder, we have that uh, narrow like sand. What we are looking at here is from the stress path, this, the red one is the lab data. 
This is the observed behavior in the uh, triaxial, under and triaxial test for this sand. Uh, this uh, MJ stress path that I'm showing you is the visual basic solution by Mike Jeffries, who proposed that North and material model. And uh, you can see that he can uh, capture the behavior that was observed in the lab uh, very uh, accurately. Our implementation of NORSAM is also based on Mike Jeffries formulation and the visual basic solution. Uh, we are getting very similar, very close behavior. The only difference here is that uh, we have different load steps here, but the predicted behavior is very close and uh, very accurately capturing the behavior that we saw in the lab. If I animate it, you can see the uh, evolution of this uh, yield surface that we have for North Sand, which is the bullet shaped camp clay model actually. And you can see it is shrinking, going back in the PQ space and capturing the liquefaction beautifully. So for this example, I am listing all these material models here for you. One of the more important parameters of this material model north end is that initial state parameter that we are looking at here. Uh, if this value is positive, usually represents a loose sand. If it's negative, usually represents a uh, dense sand. So for this case, we are looking at a loose sand and loose sands under undrained triaxial test, you can see the liquefaction behavior. If I will go for like denser sand, this is average, not, not very loose, not very dense, uh, I will assign that initial state parameter zero. The behavior that you can predict is this green line. Initially, you have that excess pore water pressure generation, but after a certain point, the behavior changes and the material can accept higher level of shear stress. And this one doesn't decrypt. If it was a denser material, so I have this one a negative value, you can see that that generation of negative excess pore water pressure is much higher and uh, much faster. And you get to those higher level of stresses much faster at lower uh, strain rates. If I have this initial state parameter actually a larger value, originally I had 0 0.06, so this is 0.1, you can get a faster liquefaction and uh, it's coming actually to lower values of shear stress. Having this tool, you can easily manipulate and adjust these parameters and see the effect of these parameters on the behavior. You can calibrate your material, calibrate your material model, constitutive model, and after that, you can take it to uh, carry out a more successful simulation using RS2, RS3, slide, slide 3, or any other tool that you are uh, using. As an example, let me go to my presentation here. Uh, I'm showing you a simulation that I did for soy pipeline interaction using the same north end material model. The problem that I'm looking at here, uh, I'm giving you the reference here if you would like to uh, get back to it and investigate yourself, the video will be available to you, you can look it up. Uh, we are looking at the buried pipeline in sand problem. Uh, they have done numerical simulation and also these are physical tests, uh, a scale physical tests that they have done it in the lab. And uh, they are looking at uh, this pipe and sand, pipeline sand interaction, and they are considering different depth for the burial of this pipe. And uh, one of the cases that they simulated is for depth versus diameter is 11.5. Uh, I'm giving you all these material properties for the sand that they have used and be calibrated against them as well. It is a dense sand material. As you see, this is a uh, negative value for initial state parameter. All the properties that I have used for stiffness, strength, for the interface, and also uh, the stiffness of the pipe, they are all given for you here. And I'm just gonna show you, uh, we don't need this one actually, I'm gonna show you the actual pipe the calibrated model. This one also, we are shipping this file with the product. This one is, is North Sand Pipeline Verification, this file. 
uh, once again, I'm showing you the stress passes for uh, three axial test, drain three axial test here. I'm comparing R Norsan versus the solution by Mike Jeffries. You are looking at a perfect match here. And I'm showing you in the other tab here, you can have as many of the stress pass tabs you can add and uh, adjust the properties that you're looking at here. Like in the first one, I was looking at the volumetric behavior versus axial strain because I was looking at a drain three axial test. In the second one, I would like to look at the undrain test. In this one, I'm looking at the pore water pressure versus axial strain. And uh, we are matching the behavior perfectly fine here. If you want to look at the hardening properties again, the animations are also available to you. The evolution of the surface, how the behavior evolves, you can take a look at it. After calibration, I'm using these properties in my simulations. And you are looking at the comparison between experimental results and the results that I took out from the reference and the results that we got from RF2 simulation. So uh, as you see here, the calibrated model to the experimental data that they presented uh, is matching the observed behavior of the soil pipe interaction, the load versus displacement. These are in very good agreement. And uh, after calibrating your material model again, if you are uh, calibrating the material model properly, you are representing it best in your simulation and you will end up with better simulation results. This is the verification for that one. Uh, a side note, if you are using NORSEN material model, uh, NORSEN in the post-peak behavior where you have the softening, uh, you usually have mesh dependency of the problem. I'm just showing you here to show that if I was going for higher number of elements, uh, the softening is more pronounced. You're getting lower graphs here, lower load at the end of the simulation. Uh, at the portion of the simulation that we had the hardening, most of these graphs, they were at the same load level. And after softening, they are deviating a little bit. This is just a note of caution if you are using any material model with softening behavior. Uh, the other case is where you had the depth of variable versus uh, dimension with the depth of diameter equal to two. This one also, I'm showing you the experimental results versus the north end results from the reference and the north end results from RS2. Once again, since everything was uh, calibrated properly at the beginning for the material model, we have the results matching perfectly fine with the experimental data. Uh, thank you very much uh, for joining us today. I will try to address as many questions as I can. Uh, if you have any question, you can actually still type in there. Uh, before getting there, I would like to just uh, remind you guys uh, about the upcoming conference, international uh, conference that we have. Uh, from April 20 to 21. This is going to be a virtual conference. And we have keynote speakers, including Dr. Everett Hook, Dr. Bowden, Dr. Poon, and Dr. Chetan. Uh, there will be two panel sessions on numerical modeling and its integration with monitoring instrumentation. We have uh, panelists that are uh, industry godfather. And uh, it is going to be a great uh, event. And you can have uh, you can register through the rock science website. I can actually show you that one as well. And at the final day, we will have a finite element workshop and a uh, one-day course, you would say. Uh, it's going to be presented by Dr. Hama and myself, and we'll be happy to have you there. Okay, let me get back to the list of questions that I have here. Let's see if I have it on the website. Okay, if from the website, actually you can click at the very top here and it's gonna direct you to the uh, link to the workshop. For the question, I'm gonna look at the list here. Uh, are we planning to have a probabilistic distribution of function for input parameters? Mm, I, I don't think we will have that in uh, our data or we can, uh, actually have that for later versions of it. 
we don't have any plan for it yet, but any feedback that we get from you guys, uh, we would appreciate it and we would consider it. Uh, so uh, I would like to invite you guys to request for trial and give us feedback. If you need anything, we can include it in the software and we will try to tailor the software, the tool as best to please our customers. Is our data going to replace Rock data? Uh, pretty soon that's gonna be the case. We will have all the functionalities of Rock data in the first tab of stress pad, strength tab of uh, our data. And in the second tab, uh, we will have that stress pass graphs and all that big to be there. Uh, the goal, the, the main uh, drive behind having these two tabs for strength and a stress path was to give all the functionalities of Rock Data in the first tab. So whoever wants to stay in that first tab, they can stay there and do their rock stuff. If they want to go stress path and deal with soil, they can go to the second tab. So we are trying to give you uh, the same simple tool that we had in Rock Data. And if you want upgrade, you can go to the second tab and uh, do all those cool animation and stress path graphs there as well. Okay, uh, if you have any more questions, please uh, email us, we will get back to you. And uh, once again, thank you very much for joining us today.